How many people remember that Bo Knows <laughs> campaign, right? Um, and what an incredible athlete, really. You think about it. Uh, I think since the 60s, he was the, 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 the person who had ever played professional baseball and football, and he was an all-star in both. I mean, just incredible. And then he had like a hip injury, and that kind of took him out, took him out of the game and so on. But um, it's not a message on football today or on Bo Jackson per se, but um, it was interesting that when I was starting to look in and research for this message that I found an interview that Bo did with Dad Magazine. And listen to what Bo has to say here. He says, I had a father, but I never had a dad, Uh, meaning my parents were never married. He lived across town with his family. Up until I was 11, I thought having a dad meant a man who came by every month and left 20 bucks. My mother was uh, my mother and father. I missed out. And that haunted me all the way to pro sports. Uh, Here was Bo Jackson, all-star baseball player, football player, top of the world in my profession, but I was envious of my teammates because they'd fly in their dads to have beers in the locker room after games. In all other aspects, my teammates envy me for my athletic ability, but for a dad, I would have traded all that in just like that. Wow, that's a statement, isn't it? That's a statement. Um, Just showing the power of our fathers in our lives, right, and and how much that affects us. and so on. And, and you know, um, I, I was just thinking that, you know, this, um, and the reason I, I bring this up is, is, is to say that, you know, whenever we start talking about God as our Father or Jesus uh, having Father like qualities, uh, depending on your experience growing up, that can bring up false images, right? False images, and and I so I just wanted to to kind of just not ignore that, uh, and to 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 kind of give a voice to it, I guess. Um, you know, there's been a lot of research done um, about, uh, and I heard a lot about this, especially in the Promise Keeper days, uh, when when the Promise Keepers ministry was very prominent, about something that I'd never heard given a name before. But I definitely understood what they were saying, this idea of father wounds. And that, you know, uh, you know for example, uh, and somebody has given some names to these. Uh, one of them was the time bomb dad who's verbally and or physically abusive. And you don't know what, uh, on any given particular day, which dad will show up. Um, I didn't have a father like that, but I had a boss like that. And uh, um, I'm thankful it was just in the workplace because I never knew which boss was going to be there that day. Was it uh, the boss that was just jovial and happy and thrilled to work with me um, or or have me work with him? Uh, Or was it going to be the guy who's like went off on me, literally it seemed like a time bomb, and said, That's not what I asked you to do when I full well had an email that showed that I did do what I was asked to do. And, um, you know, some of you can identify with that on a a boss level. But, you know, just think about growing up in that environment maybe where uh, you had a father and it was time bomb dad. And just what mixed messages you would receive and how, how when talking about God as father then could bring up some uh, difficult emotions. Then there's the emotionally distant dad who's never really expressed their loving acceptance of their son or daughter, or maybe they've never really expressed the words of how much they are proud of their son and daughter. And, uh, you know, that's something that I was just thinking about that uh, I need to do more of, even just now as my, with my adult children, just to tell them, you know, the things that I can say, you know, just I'm very proud of you because this, you know. And um, knowing that even as adult children, my children need to know that I'm proud of them and that uh, I accept them. And, uh, you know, and so um, it's just just good to be aware of this. And, you know, some of us in our parenting, we, we didn't really, you know, don't you wish your kid came with a manual? You know, you know, so, so we, 
we do, we fuddle around and, you know, we make mistakes. But I would say probably the one thing that um, I, I'm reminded of as we kind of just kind of preface this message with this information is that, you know what, we just need to be good, Parent, just parents in general, we need to be good at asking for forgiveness. We just need to be good at that because we, we know that we're going to mess up and we know that we have messed up. And when we do, we just own it and just confess it. And, um, and so that, uh, you know, sometimes it might come years later. Sometimes our kids might express to us something that they remember vividly that we have no recollection of. You know, and that can happen. And, and maybe it really marked them and we had no idea. You know, and, and, and so it's, it's, it's just good, uh, you know, even, like I said, even with our adult children, if your children are grown, it's just to, um, you know, still listen and still, you know, when, when necessary, you know, ask for forgiveness and, 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 and grace there. And then there's the absent dad, kind of like Joe ba- uh, Bo Jackson experienced, right? His, his father was absent. He was nowhere really on, uh, practically speaking, on the radar in his life. And, and um, even though many times these fathers that are absent may not intend to communicate this, but their absence in their child's life often communicates rejection. Like, I don't want you, or I didn't want you, right? Um, and, and so on. And so, um, again, my purpose here is, is not to uh, bash dads. Uh, it's just to kind of say, you know, I acknowledge the fact, and we need to also realize that um, uh, some of us just, you know, had different experiences growing up. And when you talk about God as Father, some people have a hard time relating because of that. And, and so, and God can heal that. There's no question about that. That does not have to be like the end of the story, right? Um, and so, so anyway, I, I just pray. If, if that's your experience, I pray the Lord would heal that uh, in your life and that uh, you would, uh, I don't know, for lack of a better phrase, be reparented by God to kind of know his father, what a, what a fatherliness is. But, but I guess what this leads me to here is this, you don't want to judge your heavenly father or Jesus' fatherly qualities by your earthly father because they're sinners, Right? Uh, we're all sinners. We've got to realize they're not perfect. And there's no perfect parent, right? Um, but our Heavenly Father is perfect, right? And Jesus, as we talk about his, his fatherly qualities, he's perfect, right? So uh, and, and nobody's going to experience the perfect parent. And, you know, and, and again, it's not to kind of go out of here and saying, yeah, I'm going to blame my parent for everything that's wrong in my life. You know, um, it, it is true. So there are some things that I'm sure they've probably done wrong or whatever, but, you know, I think what we need to do is say, well, God, how do I move on from there? How do I, how do I experience God as my Heavenly Father in a healthy way, right? All right, so uh, with that, why don't you go ahead and stand up with me, and let's take a look at this passage again as I read the, the Scripture. If you're able to stand, to stand up. I'm going to read this passage. This is where we've been going through these different titles for Jesus. And here in Isaiah 9, 1 through 7, which says, but, but there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought in contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Natili. But in the latter time, he was made glorious. He has made glorious the way of the sea and the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle, tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire for to us a child is born to us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father prince of peace and of the increase of his government and of the peace there will be no end on the throne of david and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore 
The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is God's word. Please have a seat. And so this is our third message in this series about these different titles, if you will, that are attributed to the Messiah, Jesus, in this uh, prophecy here in Isaiah 9, right? And so, you know, when I read that title, Everlasting Father, I just get conflicted. I get, like, theologically conflicted, okay? Um, Because you're thinking, well, we're talking about Jesus the Son, and we're calling him Everlasting Father, and I'm like, what? You know, it just does a little, for me, my brain is like, what is that about? And so a couple of things here to, to make note of when considering Jesus as everlasting father, okay? One is that this reference does not mean uh, Jesus, the son of God and God, the father are the same. Okay, they're not the same. It's not like they're, you know, uh, okay, I'm going to date myself here. A cartoon, the Wonder Twins. How many Wonder Twins people, anybody know the yeah, Wonder Twins activate, and they, like, put the rings together and f- form of an eagle, you know, or whatever. They take on these forms. So it, now, how does that relate to the, this? Let me tell you, okay? Uh, it, it's, it's, it's not like, you know, uh, that God just changes form, right? And then now we have Jesus as God, you know, poof. And now we have Jesus as the, or God as the Holy Spirit, poof, you know, and this, he's changing form. No, there's one God, three persons somehow, right, distinct, All right, that's why I'm saying I want us to realize that this title, Everlasting Father, we should not confuse that with uh, the first person of the Trinity, uh, God the Father, okay? Um, So I just kind of want to make that point here. And um, really, what I think this is here is a reference, and I've alluded to it before, of Jesus' fatherly qualities, okay? His fatherly qualities, all right? Rather than thinking about him as God the Father, because he's not. Um, another thing about this title, Everlasting Father, to think about uh, is that the word everlasting may mean uh, that whatever Jesus' fatherly qualities are, he never abandons those responsibilities. Like it's, it's forever. Like he's our forever father, okay? Um, and, and now I know he is uh, everlasting in, in that he's you know, always been, always will be, you know, the Alpha, the Omega, all of that. Um, but I'm just saying I think there might be another side to this word here, another aspect to it. We talked about the eternal nature of, eternal nature of Jesus the last time, but I think there might be another aspect to this, just that he is always doing his job, can I say that, As a, in his fatherly qualities. Another, he's never going to fail us in his fatherly duties. Okay? And that's encouraging to me because, you know, just as humans, we fail one another. And as we mentioned earlier, parents, we sometimes fail our children. Uh, uh, You know, we we just miss the mark. It's just reality, right? Uh, And so uh, I think it's good for us to realize that uh, Jesus is constant, right? We can always count on him and and these fatherly qualities. We're just going to look at a few today. Uh, You know, he is always these things to us. Okay, his, his children. Okay. All right. So, what about uh, what are some of Jesus's fatherly qualities that we could think about here today? And again, there's I'm, I'm sure there's way more than I'm thinking about here. But like a good father, Jesus knows everything about you. Jesus knows everything about you. You know my you know my my dad knows a lot of things about me. And I'm glad he doesn't really tell everybody. You know, we, we hung out with my dad and his girlfriend the other day. You know, my mom went to be with the Lord a number of years ago, and, and he's been hanging out with his lady, Patty. She's super sweet and so glad that they're hanging out together. And, but I was thinking, you know, my dad knows the good, the bad, and the ugly, man. You know, it's like, it's like that Clint Eastwood, you know. It's just, just that, that movie. Some of you guys don't even know that movie reference. Yeah. Uh, and it's a spaghetti western, as we called it. But anyway. Um, so, but, but, you know, he knows the things I like. He, 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 he uh, you know, one of the things I, I, that my dad was really good at growing up was just being there. Like, he was always at my sporting events. And, 
And uh, though I know my dad at times worked a couple of jobs um, and so on, that, you know, when he got home, it was like we went out uh, when it was the springtime and we, we, uh, we threw the baseball together, like just for hours. And he was my coach in baseball all the way up, I mean, from the very little league, you know, barely can hold a baseball bat, all the way up until I entered high school. Now, that has its pluses and minuses when your dad's the coach, you know. <laughs> just, if you've ever been a coach, it's going to get a little tricky. But, um, but he, had a, he had just always took that interest in my life. And, and so he knew, uh, he knew I loved sports. And, of course, he was a, he was a sports person himself. Actually, he could have, I saw letters of interest from professional baseball uh, uh, teams for him. But then he got in a car accident and messed his hip up, and the rest was history. But... Um, Anyway, it's not a message about my dad, but, but I'm just saying that, you know, he knows me. He knows, every, you know, just everything about me. And um, he knows my flaws. Um, and he, I, you know, one day I just remember, I, there, are thing, you know, there are things that mark you that you remember. And one day <clears throat> I remember in the hallway, there's this little hallway between the living room and the bathroom. And there is, the, I don't even know if it's there now. Maybe you'll know. There used to be a plate with Jesus' face on it. And in that hallway, I told my dad I hated him. I was, you know, teenage angst, whatever you want to call it, but no excuse. And as a dad, I'm thinking if one of my kids said that, oh, well, not only would I be mad, but it would hurt, you know. And uh, so my dad knows all that stuff, and he still loves me. Still loves me. Uh, that's amazing to me. Um, and, and, and Jesus, much more, knows everything about us, you know, the good, the bad, the thing, and he, he, he loves us. Um, so take a look at John chapter 1, if you will. Um, this is, a, this is an amazing passage to me. Um, oh, the whole Bible, you could just say, is amazing. But, you know, just it strikes me about uh, what we learn about Jesus. Um, in verse 43, John 1, 43, and we'll read on a little bit. It says, the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. And now Philip was, uh, was from Bethsaida, uh, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. <laughs> Love that. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus is like, You know, I know you. I know everything about you. And just thinking about, he knows us. And, um, and the great thing about that is that because he knows us, he knows what we need, right? Uh, love that uh, verse, and I don't have the reference handy, but just uh, talks about, you know, in our prayer life, he knows what we need before we even ask, right? Um, and, and, you know, when you're close with somebody, um, and, and it's kind of like that, you know, you kind of even almost kind of know what the other person is going to say before they say it, right? Jesus knows his children, his, son, his children. He knows them, and he knows exactly what they need. And I'm so thankful uh, that Jesus is like that for us, is that he's aware of everything that's going on in my life. Uh, nothing escapes him. And, uh, and so... He knows everything about me. You know, there's other things that you can um, think about this. <laughs> I thought about this because I'm, I'm bald. But uh, he knows every hair on my head. Now, 
it doesn't take him that much to count them now. But he knows, you know, Luke 12, 7, where it says you know, he knows every hair and head. In, in other words, the point is not that he can count hairs, you know, though he can. The point is he knows everything intimately about us. And when I think about that, then I'm like, well, who do I want to go to then to talk about what's going on in my life? Him. I want to go to him. I want to tell him. Because he, he, even though I, I, with my mouth I tell him, he's like, well, yeah, I know that. But, um, but it's so healing and helpful when we do pour our hearts out to the one who knows us like he knew Nathaniel, right? Without necessarily having to even be there, right? He's, he's, he knows everything about us. And then, of course, um, just thinking about God in general um, is, is going back to what, you know, a very probably popular psalm for many is Psalm 139, right? Um, and, uh, you know, in those... You know, in verse 13 of Psalm 139, it says, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Uh, and he says, I, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. Um, you know, we need to remember, this is who God says we are. We are his creation. And he calls his creation wonderful, right? Wonderful. And so he, he knew us before we ever drew a breath. Okay, and now, you know, this is something that maybe you can know theologically, but we, I think we need to just say, Lord, I, I just need to be renewed in my, and this is worthy of this word, awesomeness of God, in that he knows. He knows everything about us, every cell in our body. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. You know, God knows every, every day that we're going to have, the first and the last. So like a good father, Jesus knows everything about you. Another aspect is like a good father, Jesus forgives you completely. You know, and that's, that's where I had this memory of, uh, you know, really going off on my dad in that back hallway. You know, it's just like, you know, um, I've had to ask forgiveness many times over the years uh, from my parents for different things, as I'm sure every child does. Um, but I'm so thankful that, you know, um, Jesus is perfect, and he forgives perfectly, and we see uh, all kinds of indications about his forgiveness all throughout the Scripture. One of them is in Colossians chapter 1, our, our uh, Saturday men's uh, monthly meeting. We've been, we just finished up the book of Colossians, and you know, if there was ever a book that was f- so focused on Jesus, and who he is, it's Colossians. Uh, I mean, really, the, there's that thread throughout the entire Bible that points us to Jesus. But that, this book of Colossians um, really uh, tells us so much about Jesus. So Colossians chapter 1, 13 and 14 talks about forgiveness in Jesus. So it says, um, he has delivered us this is uh, Colossians 1.13. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So the beloved son, Jesus, right? In whom, so in Jesus, in whom we have redemption, comma, the forgiveness of sins. So in Jesus, we have the forgiveness of sins, right? And so um, I hope that um, if, you know, if you have not put your faith in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, that you would. Uh, it, it is the only way to God. It is the only way to have a, a relationship with God because our sins separate us from him. And there's only one thing that will bridge that separation, and that is Jesus himself and his sacrifice on the cross. And so this, 
this uh, these these words in Colossians there that we are we are he has delivered us from the domain of darkness. So that's that's our state when we're born into this world. We're in we're in darkness, uh, in, in spiritually speaking. And and we need uh, we need to be transferred to the kingdom of light, or kingdom of His beloved Son, Jesus. And the only way to do that is by a confessing that we need a Savior from our sins, and to acknowledge that Jesus is that one and only Savior. And in that acknowledgement, uh, we we can come to know Him. And so. Uh, also, I, and I think about the, just God's forgiveness in general. So, you know, forgiveness is, is, is accessed here through Jesus' sacrifice, right? Redemption is found in him. But think about uh, Psalm 103 uh, when you th- think also about uh, God's forgiveness just in general. Start in verse 8, Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. Verse 12, As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions, or you know, our sins, from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Isn't that a good word? You know, complete forgiveness, as far as the east is from the west. That's what he's trying to show us is that we are completely forgiven when our faith is in Jesus and what he has done. Completely. Completely. And I think this is good to remind ourselves of. You know, you again, the longer you're a Christian, I think it's easy to take this for granted, this complete forgiveness. Um, and sometimes we can slip into this idea of, well, uh, you know, maybe earning God's love, just kind of like people might try to earn their own fa- uh, earthly father's love and look for uh, his approval by performance-based living, right? Well, we cannot earn God's love by trying to be better, okay? He fully loves us and fully forgives us through Jesus, okay? It's, it's uh, our... It's not based on performance. Like, you know, if I'm good enough, he really loves me today. If I'm not so good uh, the next day, then he doesn't love me as much. No, God uh, and the Lord Jesus are not like that whatsoever. And Zephaniah, in the book of Zephaniah, you know, he talks about how the Lord sings over us. He sings over his children. I mean, that just gives you a picture there uh, uh, of, of God's love, it, it kind of this fatherly love for his children and us, you know, if you know Christ as Savior. So, so just thank the Lord today, if for nothing else, that if you know Jesus as Savior, you don't have to earn his love. In fact, he's demonstrated his love for you, it says in Romans 5, and that, and that while we were at sinners, Christ died for us. He's shown you how much he love, loves you. And we should praise God for that. That should be enough right there. And when I think about all the things I've done wrong and still do wrong, and he still accepts me. He still sets his love on me because he sees me through Jesus. Not because uh, he's just going to sweep our sin under the carpet and say, oh, well, it doesn't matter. That's not what happens. You know, you, we need a Savior. God doesn't just say, oh, I'm so nice, I'll just forgive all people's sins. No. Now, that's why Jesus came, right? Was to, to make a way to God the Father through what Jesus did. But in John 1, 12, why don't you turn there with me if you have your device or your, your, um, your Bible. This is a, this is a good verse uh, to, 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 uh, to really 
keep in mind when, when we're talking about being God's children, okay? And what, what it you know, how, how are you brought into the family of God? How are you brought into the family of God? See, uh, John 1, verse 12 Actually, let's back up to verse 9 um, in, in John 1. It says, The true light, which is light to everyone, was coming into the world. This is speaking of Jesus. It was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. We mentioned that last week, that you know Jesus was involved in creating everything. right? And he holds it together, we learned. right? It says, Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. He was rejected by his own people. But now here's verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That, that right there just tells us, you know, how do you become a child of God? Well, you have to receive Jesus. And what does that mean to receive Jesus? Well, really, I suppose there's different ways to think about it. But one way is to think about it's, it's welcoming, welcoming him into your life. It's accepting who he is and who he says he is. God come in the flesh, uh, the Lord, uh, whose rightful place is to be at the center of our lives. And for us to submit to him, you know, like you see in these shows that are so popular now. We, you know, I, I, I watch some of these, like The Crown, uh, the Netflix, or uh, what's the other one, Victoria. You know, and I, I'm not, that's not an endorsement of these things, but because some of it's not going to be good. But, but uh, the point I'm bringing up is we don't live where there's a monarchy, right? We, you don't bow to somebody. But you do to the queen. You know, it's, it's a, they have this position, right? Jesus' rightful position is, to, is Lord. Is Lord of our lives. To, to, to say what goes, right? And to give him free reign in our lives. He's Lord and Savior, Right? And so we, we need to welcome that. And that kind of, you know, it takes the grace of God to receive that. Right? Everything in my fleshly side of my person is like, ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. You know, that's the flesh, right? Does not like anyone to tell it what to do. But by the grace of God and the Spirit of God, when He draws us, it enables us to say, you're my Lord. And I bow to you. I submit to you. You can have your rule and reign in my life. And I receive your forgiveness as I confess my sin to you. And that's, that's receiving Jesus. And if you have never done that, Today's is as good a day as any to simply welcome him and acknowledge him for who he is. Okay? Lord and Savior. So we, when we do that, we, we are completely forgiven. Last quality I want to look at here this morning, fatherly quality of Jesus is like a good father. Jesus will never leave you. And Jesus will never leave you. And, and um, you know, we, 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 Bo Jackson's story there, the absent father, right? Um, but you can count on the Lord. You can count on him, okay? Uh, there, there are so many passages in Scripture, um, a, a couple I'll mention to you. One, 
you know, one of them is just in, in uh, I don't think we mentioned this one here recently, but Hebrews, the book of Hebrews chapter 13. Um, verse 5 says, um, t- basically talking about money and contentment, really. Um, it, it's really about contentment with circumstances and and, and that God um, is the one who will will provide our every need regardless of whether it's financial or otherwise and so it's here that we seek it says keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have for he has said I will never leave you nor forsake you Isn't that a great promise there? And he's referencing Psalm 118, verse 6. It just just this, he's saying, you know, listen, you don't have to you have to worry about it. You know, think about you know, his like a father is to provide for their family, right? The Lord will provide for us. Okay. And he says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm there for you. Regardless, you know, when we, you and I, our physical bodies are, we're limited. We can only be at one place at one time. And the Lord, though, he can be with anyone, anywhere. And he will never leave us nor forsake us. You know, I mentioned this verse last week. I'll, I'll, you can just write it down if you want. Matthew twenty-eight twenty where Jesus there before he ascends to be with the Father. um, He says, I am with you always to the disciples to the end of the age, right? I'm with you always, with you always. I mean, what a great promise. Again, these are things that, um, I don't know about you, but I need to almost pray these back to God. I, I need to say, well, I know that theologically, but I want to engage my, my, my mind, my lips, just to remind myself that he's with me, right? Emmanuel, God with us, right? Um, but now we, have, we, we, we um, have the deposit of his Holy Spirit, right? And he's with us in that sense. Now, this is interesting. Now, this is not about a fatherly aspect, but a motherly aspect, because I just thought, you know, this idea of, of him never leaving us or forgetting us, I just thought this is a great verse for us to get this idea that, that the Lord, um, he, nothing slips by him. He will not forget us. And that is in Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah 49, and then um, verse, we'll start in verse 14. It says, um, But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. You ever feel that way? You know, the circumstances you're going through, like, Hello, God! <laughs> you know, if we're, if we're just honest, sometimes, you know, uh, we know our Heavenly Father never sleeps, He never slumbers, right? All that, we know that, but yet the circumstances, sometimes we feel that way. Um, But then it goes on to say in verse 15, here's God's response. Here's the Lord's response to, um, you know, to, in a sense, the Lord's people saying, you've forgotten us, God. What did he say? He says, can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? And, of course, that's rhetorical. It's like, no, it's not going to happen. There ain't no mommy going to forget her child. But he says, even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Isn't that great? God's like, you know, think think about moms, you know, and how they'll never forget their kids. Oh, you know what? You always hear, once a mom, always a mom, you know. And, and, And yet God said, okay, even maybe they might forget their kids, but I'll never forget you. In other words, I'll never leave you. 
And, you know, we, we need to... Uh, I, what does the enemy do? Satan. He's the father of lies, right? So what does he want to do? He wants to lie to us about many things, including who God is and how he is to us as a father and how, what Jesus' fatherly qualities are like. He wants to say, nah, nah, he's, he's forgotten you. You know, what's going on just really proves God's out to lunch. You know, that's what the enemy, he, we, 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 he, he speaks lies. If Satan's mouth is moving, he's lying. Okay? And I think what we need to do is just embrace and proclaim these truths we're learning here today. And you and I can extinguish the flaming arrows or missiles of the evil one. Those lies with the truth. But you can't do that unless you know the truth, right? And so we put up that shield of faith. We know, and, and, and we, we gird, our, gird ourselves, right, with the belt of truth. Because that is our armor. That's how we win these battles. And, you know, there's so many things that go on that, in here that nobody sees, Right? But Jesus is everlasting Father to us. And among other things, it reminds us that, you know, he knows everything about us, right? He knows everything about us and he forgives us completely, right? He's not withholding his love or his forgiveness and that he will never leave you, all right? Let's thank the Lord together. <clears throat> Father in heaven, We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that um, you give us these titles that help us understand who the Messiah is and what he's like. And we're so thankful for this image of an everlasting father, a forever father. He never slacks or lacks uh, on his responsibilities in these fatherly qualities. Lord, I do pray too that if any of us here, when the early part of the message we were talking about some of those father wounds, Lord, that if that really resonates, I pray, Lord, that your spirit would begin to work there to bring about healing and that you would help them to experience you as the loving father and as the perfect father and um, heal up those wounds. And if there's forgiveness that need to be granted, Lord, grant the grace of forgiveness. And um, But Lord, we want to praise you Praise you for the Savior, who is wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. May we know him better this Christmas season. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.